BC Calc, Lesson 2.1, Rates of Change and Limits. So, Unit 1's review. Hopefully you've seen it all before. If not, you have some work to do. But now we get into calculus-like things, and the first thing is a limit. They're going to come up all year, so do not gloss over them and say, well, I can solve problems even though I don't really understand them. They're not that difficult to work with, but originally they're kind of difficult to understand. So let's just talk about something that is really where calculus came from. We'll talk about average velocity. Um, we want to find the average velocity of something. We write it as a change. So the change in y over the change in t. I went 50 feet in 10 seconds. I'm going 5 feet per second. So on top is how far you're going at time t plus some h minus how far you were at t. So, you know, h is some number. You were at time t here, you were going, you were standing at 5, and at h seconds later, you're standing at 10, you went 5 feet. And then we divide it by h, and that's the amount of time that you move. So I went 5 feet in 2 seconds, that sort of thing. We're going to play with this one a while, so get used to seeing that and take some time to understand what it means. So, let's say the displacement of a falling object is 16t squared. Find the average speed. Um, this bothered me because I said, well, shouldn't there be a negative in there? Um, and then somebody pointed out to me that it's speed, not velocity, so sign does not matter. Just be aware it's falling to the ground and it's going faster and faster as we get closer and closer to the ground. So 16 uh, at time 2, which is... Um, 0 plus 2 if we're going to be consistent with our formula up there because uh, then we go minus 16 at time 0 all over 2 minus 0 which is h so we can just say 2 but helps to know if we start at time 0 um, gives us 32 feet per second and that's an average velocity this thing is not moving at 32 feet per second at two seconds. It's not moving at zero. For At zero, it's not moved at all. It's just standing there. You let go, and then it starts to accelerate. So you say, well, what good is that? And I say, well, it's not. That's why calculus was invented. They want to know what's going on instantaneously at any instant. So we look at the average speed formula, and then we mess with it a little bit. we say, hey, this works and we don't know what H is because we're going to try and calculate a formula that will tell us what it is at any time. And we say we want an instantaneous speed. So that's a speed where H gets closer and closer to zero, isn't it, at any instant instant being defined as the time is zero. The time is, is so small that it's basically zero. When you look at the formula and say, well, we can't divide by zero. That's impossible. So we say, yeah, we kind of got a little trick here. You'll notice that uh, 16 times 4 cancels. And then I can actually cancel an H here, here, and here. So that I'm left with, six, these are going to, these are going to cancel. I'm left with uh, 16 times 4 plus H. And we said, well, we want to calculate this as h gets closer and closer to 0. So it's just 16 times 4. 64 feet per second at t equals 2. So we had an average velocity of 32 feet per second. But at 2 seconds, it's actually moving. For that instant, 64 feet per second. This takes some getting used to, and we're going to revisit it over and over and over again.
So I just did this. Uh, but while we're here, let's write it the way it's usually written. Let's limit as x approaches 2 of the change in y, pardon me, as h approaches 2 over in change in t is 64 feet per second. And that's a limit. We're going to do this a lot. Not sure what's going on? Don't worry about it. We're trying to introduce a concept and then take it up. A lot of times you look at a limit and you say, well, that's impossible. We can't divide by zero. And that's exactly what limits exist for. Um, sometimes we give you really easy limits that you can just punch in numbers. You'll see that in a little bit. Um, a lot of times you have to graph it. So we go up here and we say y equals sine of x over x and we graph it. And I've zoomed in and you say, oh, look, as we get closer and closer to the y-axis, where x equals 0, it sure looks like it's going to hit 1. It can't actually hit it because we would be dividing by 0. And if you look at the table, that's what you'll see, 0 0.999, 999, error. But a limit doesn't care what actually happens. It cares what happens as we get closer and closer and closer. So in this case, the limit is 1. This is one of the most used limits. Make sure you know it. Keep x in radians. Not that big a deal. I was in radians on my calculator. Another limit that pops up as x approaches 0 of cosine of x minus 1 over 0. If you look at that, that's 0 over 0, just like the previous one is. This would be 0. If you graph it, you'll see. And then um, two more limit of x approaching 0 of sine of ax over x is a. And a little bit out of space here. Change up color so we can see what's going on. Limit as x approaches 0 of sine of ax over sine of bx is a over b. We can actually prove all these with tools that will develop over the entire year. And we'll constantly come back and say, hey, let's look at it again. Use our tool. Hey, look, it still equals 1. That sort of thing. Um, remember these four. Notice all these limits are as x approaches 0. They don't have to be. We'll get to that in the next lesson. Um, but we're just getting you a taste of limits. And it's going to take some getting used to. There's a lot of rules to remember. Uh, calculus likes to make definitions. Do not worry about this one. It's a classic definition, and what they're saying is, I've just talked about limits in a general sense. Hey, it's a limit. You know, just kind of feel it out. Mm, that doesn't work in mathematics. So they said, listen, what if we say this L is the limit for the Y variable, the F of X, in this case, uh, in the previous case, an F of T, and the epsilon is a limit for the X variable, then we can define it saying, oh, as this gets closer to closer to zero, as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, then L gets smaller and smaller, and there's proofs and all sorts of math that goes with this. Don't worry about it. It will not be something you have to worry about now. If it does pop up in the future, we'll work on it then and, and sort it out. Examples really help here. Graph this on your calculator, and you will find that you get a straight line going through 1 with a hole at 1. Use a little color here. Graph the second one. Uh, this is a uh, f of x. You're going to find the same thing, except we defined a dot there. This is g of x, and this one is just a straight line. Nothing's changed. So you have three situations here. 
and I wanted you to find the limit as x approaches 1. So a lot of people are freaked by this. Say so as we get come up along this line and we're marching along, what does it look like we're about to hit? Not what do we actually hit, but there's a hole there, or what's actually happening at x equals 1. No, what happens is we get closer and closer. Oh, well, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is 2. Because that's what it looks like it's getting closer and closer to. 2 right here, right across from the dot. And then look at this one. You say, well, no, we, we dropped it down. They put this weird little it equals 1 and x equals 1. So it's got to be something different. I say, no, what is the limit as we get closer and closer? And actually, we have to do both sides. What does it look like? Well, it looks like we're going to hit 2. Then that's the limit. But no, we didn't actually hit 2. It's something else. It doesn't matter. What does it look like we're going to hit? And here, we actually hit it. Right there. What are we getting closer and closer to? What are we getting closer and closer to? The limit as x approaches 1, which h of x is 2. This takes getting used to. I've got more examples for you. Let it, let it work in your brain for a little bit. We'll see where it takes you. Here's a bunch of properties of limits. They're there. Again, it's very mathematical. Um, I'm not going to get into it. I use this one fairly often. You'll see in a little bit how I do that. Um, and a lot of them are common sense. Uh, you look at this one, and there's no holes. There's no asymptotes. There's no problems. So you just plug in 3. This just equals... 3 squared, 2 minus 3, equals negative 9. And it's stupid. It's like, well, don't you mean just what is that function as we go to 3? Yes, in this case, the function as we go to 3 is the same as the limit as we go to 3. It's not always going to be the case, though. This one, you say, well, we can't divide by 0. I guess we're stuck. I say, no. This is where we use one of those properties. Tangent is sine over cosine. Sine of x over x times 1 over cosine of x. Cosine gets closer and closer to 0, becomes 1. Sine of x over x is 1. Why? Because we already proved, well, we already looked at that. We haven't proved it yet. So you just get to 1. Not sure? Check in your calculator and graph it. It's not a problem. And then the most popular way to explain limits, back to the top, back to the bottom, Cancel things and then just plug it in. 1 minus 2 on top, 1 plus 1 on bottom. The limit is negative 1 half. And if you graphed it and said it's getting closer and closer and closer and looked at the table, it would be 0 0.495, 0 0.498, 0 0.499. Error, but you'd know that the limit is 0.5, negative 0.5. So it's important to remember that limit has to come from both sides. Um, a lot of people get lost on this. It's, uh, it's challenging. There's no question about it. So, for example, if I graph this, and I use my calculator graph a lot. I'm not doing it here just because it would take so much time. I get something like this. I'm playing with my calculator right now just to make sure I did it right. So there should be something on the upper right. Yeah, and then there's something up here. And this is an asymptote at x equals 2. How do I know? Because the bottom would set me, if I set the bottom equal to 0, I'd get x equals 2. So you'd say, what's the limit? And then we go with does not exist. Because this side limit is getting closer and closer to what we call positive infinity. I'm going to work on that next lesson. This limit's getting closer and closer to what we call negative infinity. So the shorthand is just D and E. More on that soon. Um, by the way, that bothers people. They say, hey, whoa, 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 man, I can find a limit if I was coming just from the right. They say, fine, we'll let you define that. If you look at 1 over x, you get a graph like this, graph like that. And so this says we're coming from the negative side. We're marching along here, and we're getting closer and closer to negative infinity. 
this says, well, we're coming from the positive side. We're marching along here. All right, then we're coming towards positive infinity. This says, what's the limit at zero? Both sides have to match up. And since they don't, you say it does not exist. My concern on these problems is that you will miss the little negative and the little positive. They're hard to see. Read the full question. So one more time. Look at this diagram. What's the limit as x approaches 1 from the negative side? So here's 1. From the negative side means we're coming this way. And it's getting closer and closer and closer to 0. What's the limit as x approaches 1 from the uh, positive side? That's a mistake. should say positive side. Um, okay, coming along this way, it is 1. What would be the limit as x approaches 1? It would not exist. Because one side does one thing, one side does another. How about 2 from the negative side? Now we're going this way. Looks like it's getting closer and closer to 1. How about 2 from the positive side? Now we're going this way. Looks like it's getting closer and closer to 1. So we could actually say the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x equals 1. Confused? Yeah. Welcome to the party. Lots and lots and lots and lots going on here. But we'll get it done. Last thing, we're going to come back to this next lesson. It's called the sandwich theorem. Um, and it's another way to understand limits, and I don't really particularly like it very much. Um, what it's saying is if you graphed this, and it really works with sine and cosine as far as I've been able to tell, you would get something like this. And if you look at just the x squared function, you would say, well, x squared kind of fits right here. And I know I didn't graph that perfectly. And negative x squared right here. I know what the limit of x squared is as it approaches 0. It's 0. Therefore, the limit for this is 0. Here's how we do it algebraically. Again, don't get hung up on it. We'll say the absolute value, of, and we'll just pluck this out of thin air, because a lot of people go, how'd you get that? Yeah, I practiced, that's all. The only answer I can give you. Absolute value of x squared times sine of 1x is the absolute value of x squared times the absolute value of sine of 1 over x. And by the way, you can't always make assumptions about sine of 1 over x. I've had some problems go very strange on me. This is less than or equal to absolute of x squared times 1, because sine always bounces between negative 1 and 1. Hope that makes sense. Which is going to equal x squared. Drawing this out with... Uh, greater than or less than, we say that means that basically what I just graphed, negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared times sine of 1 over x less than or equal to x squared. Since the limit of negative x squared is 0, as x approaches 0, limit of Negative x squared equals the limit of x squared, which equals 0. You can say that limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine of 1 over x equals 0. Now, we're not using this much. People say, well, why are you even bothering to show us? say because this is the kind of complex stuff you will see in calculus you have to be prepared for it it gets a little nasty it's geometry proofs married to algebra go do some problems happy mathing <laughs>